This morning's Old Testament comes from the book of Job in the third chapter. Here now, this is a passage um, of his openness and honesty before God. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why were there knees to receive me or breasts for me to suck? Now I would be lying down and quiet. I would be asleep. Then I would be at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves or with princes who have gold, who fill their houses with silver. Or why was I not buried like a stillborn child, like an infant that never sees the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are free from their masters. Why is light given to one in misery, and life to bitter in soul, who long for death but it does not come? and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way, whom God has fenced in? From my sighing comes like bread, my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes.
Good morning. I need to preface the reading of the scripture this morning because I was taught a lesson last Sunday that I learned in church a long time ago. And uh, that is, you have to be careful what you say to the pastor. And as I left last Sunday, uh, I thanked uh, Pastor Winston for his sermon and the, particularly the scripture that he read from Philippians 4. And I said, but you know, I said, I re really never fully understood one of those verses until I read it in the message. I got a call on Wednesday this week from Barb Heflin, and she says, the pastor wants you to read uh, the pa second passage of scripture this morning, but read it from the message. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, how many of you here are, are familiar with the message? Well, th I, I should tell you that the message, the the person who wrote it was a Presbyterian minister. He was minister of the Bel Air, Maryland Presbyterian Church for 39 years. And each Sunday, he would read the scripture and then he would kind of translate it. So it, it was time he created this book called The Message, and he calls himself the translator. And I would say, though, that, Pastor, that uh, the, uh, the message... Uh, was gone over by 20 different uh, theological seminaries, two of which were Presbyterian, and okayed it. So uh, if you would like to follow in your book, it won't sound the same, but uh, in your Bible, uh, it, it'd be on page 96. And it is uh, John 9, verses 1 to 12. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? Jesus said, you are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When the night falls, the work day is over. For as long as I am in the world, there is plenty of light. I am the light of the world. He said this and then spit into the dust, made a clay paste with saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes, and said, Go, wash at the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. The man went and watched, washed and saw. Soon the town was buzzing. His relatives and those who year after year had seen the blind man begging were saying, Why, isn't this the man we knew? Who sat here and begged? Others said, It's him, all right. But others objected. It's not the same man at all. It just looks like him. He said, It's me, the very one. They said, How did your eyes get open? He said, a man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me, go to the Siloam and wash. I did what he said. When I washed, I saw. So where is he? I don't know. May God add this, his blessing to reading of this word. Thanks to John and Ruth for reading the scriptures for us this morning. The text that I want to pay attention to as I invite you to meditate on the word of the Lord comes from the first reading that Ruth read, Job chapter 3 and verse 23, where Job with bitter lament, asks, Why is light given to one who cannot see the way, whom God has totally fenced in? And the subject you see is taken from Kushner's book, which I'm sure many of you have read, 
when bad things happen to good people. And notice it is not why bad things happen to good people. That's another sermon all entirely. But when bad things happen to good people. Let us pray. Stand amongst us now, Lord, we pray thee in your risen power. May this time of worship be an hallowed hour, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, for thou art our strength and our salvation. Amen. I recall how a very dear cousin of mine called me from England to tell me that her husband, her dear husband, John, who was in his early 50s, had gone into the hospital for a fairly routine surgical procedure to remove a cyst from his lung. And she said, the moment the doctors started the procedure, they soon discovered that he was riddled with a metastasized cancer all over his body. Five days later, he was dead. A few months after this unexpected tragedy, my cousin's dear mother, my beloved Aunt Lucille, she died of one of the most painful deaths imaginable. And my cousin's two daughters, ever since those twin blows of losing their father, John, and their grandmother, Lucille, one after the other, they have been so shattered by it all that to this day they have been a total emotional wreck. I can only imagine that what struck such a devastating blow on my family a while ago is multiplied for countless families in our country today, when according to the latest U.S. Census data, 39.7 million Americans lived with devastating poverty last year, 2017, the same number as in 2016. And of these, listen to this, of these 39.7 million people who lived with poverty, 12.7 million were children. And if that is not bad enough, 5.7 million of these 39.7, they worked part-time and still suffered the pain of unrelenting poverty in this, the richest country in the world. When bad things like these happen to good people here in our country, in Mexico Beach, in Istanbul, Turkey, or Syria, and other places, I ask you this morning, how can we Presbyterian sit still and hesitate to pray and to vote for a new day? I'm asking us this morning, how does our faith function when fierce frustration at the appalling unfairness of life is all we face constantly? 
I believe if you ask Job that question, he would say, that makes me mad as hell. For me or anybody else to feel cornered by life and fenced in by God on every side. How do you feel? Have you ever been really driven by such sadness of soul and such deep disillusionment with life that you cry out like Job of old, why did I not die at birth? Why is life given to those who find it so bitter? And why is light given to one who cannot see the way as you're wandering blindly around, fenced in, like the Palestinians are in their own country and the Mexicans at the border, fenced in by God and all kinds of political leaders on every side? I ask you again this morning, what do you do? What do you think? How do you feel when bad things happen to good people? If you ask me for an answer, I would say first and foremost, instead of panicking or pouncing or pouncing on the nearest person, how about praying? for patience and resilience and calmness of mind to follow Isaiah's admonition when he said to his people in chapter 55 and verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. But especially when God doesn't seem to be near, pray and keep on praying that God will save you from people with worn out, cute sounding, but very trite, thoughtless, unhelpful, and often downright repugnant answers like, God knows best. And that is supposed to comfort a heart broken in a thousand pieces and a head pounding with migraine? Or have you heard, God never gives you more than you can bear? Who can bear the onslaught of double pneumonia in both lungs? Or Parkinson's disease spiraling out of control and threatening to shut down every muscle, including your, mu your, your throat muscle, so that you would choke to death and can't even swallow your food? Need I mention diabetes? When it turns deadly on you or any of the dread cancers? Pray, I'm saying to us this morning, pray. That well-intentioned friends and family members, when they have nothing significant or sustaining and insightful to say, will simply be wise enough to keep silent or just blame it on climate change and, and say it's the El Nino that is in the world. Secondly, pray, but how about pondering this? That Job's friends had nothing significant and or sustaining to say to him beyond the old, worn-out, traditional, theological legalism, blame the victim kind of a talk. If bad things are happening to you, you must have sinned. So stop pretend, pre pretending that you are righteous. Just fess up and take your licks like a man. They meant well. But poor, unenlightened soul, that's all that they knew. Didn't the disciples of Jesus years later come to him with the same outmoded theological understanding and looked at the blind man 
whose story John read to us a while ago and asked the preposterous question, Lord, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus was impatient with their simple-minded solution, and he taught them a lesson that I pray that we, so many years later, have learned when he said, it was not that this poor man and his parents sinned, so that he was born blind, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. What he was saying, I hope you listen to this and hear this if you don't hear anything else. In the unfinished work of God conquering chaos and evil in the world with all its attendant pain and suffering, that work that was begun by the Creator at the dawn of creation, we must continue that work with God's help as we show compassion and care, not pass judgment on those who are in trouble and who are in need near and far. And so I ask you this morning, is that what you do when bad things happen to good people around you with no apparent reason or explanation. I remember the story of Helen, a young mother of two, and she was in her early 30s. She noticed that she was getting tired very easily at the least exertion. And one night she was coming home from dinner and she stumbled and fell right at her doorstep. She had nothing to drink while she had dinner. And so she was very worried and the next morning she called up her doctor and sought to have an assessment. She went in and the diagnosis was multiple sclerosis, MS. And the doctor explained that this degenerative nerve disease would slowly but surely lead to her becoming totally disabled and then it would take her life. And Helen shouted, why is this happening to me? I had tried, I have always tried all my life to be a good person. I have a husband and these children who need me now more than ever. Why would God make us suffer like this, John? And some would, someone heard her questioning and shouting like that and said, don't question God. And she snapped back and she said, the disciples did all the time, and Job of old, he did too, didn't he? And then she asked the, the poignant question. She said, do you think Jesus was playing trick or treat when he was facing the cross and just quoting from memory, Psalm 22, when he cried out in anger and with total disbelief, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did Jesus feel the compelling need to withdraw from the crowds and the disciples to go up to the mountain to pray regularly? He needed answers to life's puzzling problems, didn't he, like we do? But most of all, like we, Jesus always needed a powerful presence to sustain us when the shock of bad things numbs and disorients, when the difficulty and the disbelief that it's really happening to you and those you care for gives way to anger turned in upon itself and upon those who are nearest to you. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Let me end by telling you the story of the hymn writer, 
Sibylla Martin. She talks about how she was visiting a bedridden Christian friend of hers one day. And as she got in the door, she asked her, my good friend, after all these years in your condition, don't you ever feel broken and totally discouraged by your condition? And to her amazement, her friend quickly replied, how can I, Sister Martin, when I know my Heavenly Father watches over the little sparrows of the field, and I know he watches over me. She didn't say, I hope, I think. She said to Sevilla Martin, I know he watches over me. Martin was so impressed with her friend's faith in God, she went home. And she was inspired to write the hymn that I invite us to sing now, Why Should I Feel Discouraged? And why should the shadows fall? His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. Is that your faith this morning? If it is, I invite you to stand and let us sing it's the hymn number 661 in our hymn books. Why should I feel discouraged? 